I want to remind us again of our scripture. We're in our second week of the spirit of Christmas, and I pray that you have already have in your heart the spirit of Christmas. Now, I'm not talking about the goosebumps and the, the feel-good movies, and all. I'm not talking about that spirit of Christmas. And I like that part of stuff. I like all the good food and that kind of thing. Don't get me wrong, and all the all the Christmas movies and the gift giving and all. That's that's part of the spirit of giving and love. But aren't you thankful for the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that that is a part of our Christmas, is a part of our everyday life. Not something we turn on or off, but it's it's the Holy Spirit of God. And I want to get it in your hearts during this season that you have the Spirit of God living in you if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And Isaiah, the prophet, reminds us of this. And I want to re bring your attention to chapter 9 and verse 6 for our theme scripture. And read, if you will, out loud, if we, we will, with me this morning. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, say it out really loud with me, if you will, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. One more time, His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want to bring us our, our attention today to the title that the prophet Isaiah brings out to us. He's a Mighty God. Look at your neighbor say, He's a Mighty God. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like. He is a Mighty God. God bless you guys. I'm so thankful that you're here. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here this morning. And if you don't know him, introduce yourself. Now's a good time for that. Recognizing the power of God in our lives through the Holy Spirit. I love this term, mighty God. And when I think of mighty, what, what are some things that come to mind when you think of mighty God? I, I, uh, I might date myself here a little bit, but I think of, uh, remember mighty, the word mighty, what, what comes to, to mind? I think of uh, mighty mouse. Does anybody remember mighty mouse? Yeah, little guy, but strong, man. Huh? Mighty ducks, mighty, mighty mouse. You know, he, he was that, he could do anything, but he was that little guy and he could do mighty things and I think, is that, is that the terminology that Isaiah is saying here, that he is mighty? He is, he, he, what is that word mighty, and what does he mean by that? And I, and I want to open that up a little bit to you this morning, but I want you to know this morning, I'm, I've been so excited to preach this word, especially to, through a very difficult season in several lives and families that we're embracing. And, and I, see, I see the mighty power of God in the middle of those things. He is mighty to save this morning. You believe that this morning? He is mighty to save. He is mighty to heal. He is mighty to restore. He's mighty God. And I love this terminology that the prophet Isaiah brings out about mighty. God's mighty acts. He's, he's speaking of the mighty acts of justice and righteousness that, that focuses on restoration. He's, he's speaking about a coming child that's going to be the Messiah that, that's been promised and it's going to bring restoration to the children of Israel. And we are remnants of that. We are part of that tribe. And he's saying, there is, there is a mighty God that can bring you back into relationship with the, with the Father. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I might, I might j jump up and down a couple times this morning. Is that all right? I might just even leap off. <laughs> I saw a missionary one time. And this brother, I talked to him not long ago. He was, he was a missionary from Poland. And he took, he, he was walking along, he was preaching, he got into the middle of that fire, fiery message he was preaching, and he, and he missed that first step and took a leap and rolled across the floor, bounced back up, and kept on preaching, man, I love it. So if that happens today, I'm just going to keep going, all right? Praise and thanksgiving was, was given for the works that, that God had already been doing, that he would be doing, and throughout the generation after generation after generation, there were stories that were told and songs that were sung that passed down through the generations, and it, and it became a place of trust in God of these mighty acts. How many trust God this morning, the living God? You've lived long enough, and you have faith long enough to know that God is who he says he is, and his word is what it says, and he will do what he says he will do in his word. He is God. He is, he is mighty. And I love this when, when the, the prophet brought this out. Mighty, believing and seeking God to continue the, the mighty acts in the future. The mighty acts that, we're, that we already know and that he will continue to do mighty acts. 
There's this, there's this trust in God, the mighty God. Mighty. Mighty is closely related to what would be termed as a warrior king. It's this, this powerful champion, if you will. The attributes are, are wisdom and understanding. Mighty is God. Mighty is his counsel. Mighty God. The Hebrew name for God, this mighty God, is El Gibor. And the word designated for this expected Messiah, the prophet Isaiah brings out here in Isaiah 9, 6. And he's talking about this El Gabor, this, this El, this part of, part of God, the, the title of God, the Elohim of God. He is, he is God. This Hebrew name, that, this word designed for this expected Messiah, this one true God. Everybody say one true God. He's one true God. And in John 10, we see where there's a conflict that arises and Jesus is making the claim that he is mighty God. I love this. I'm going to bring your attention to it in John 10 and verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews were gathered there around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I love this. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And the Father, and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. They didn't, this, 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 this outraged them. And, and Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Who, we are not, we're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but blaspheme because you are a mere man and you claim to be God. And Jesus answered them, it is written in your law. Is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's little G. And if you called them God's to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Listen, I want you to get this in your heart this morning. Do not believe me unless I do the works of the father. We see him doing the works of the father. But, I, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. You see, the term used as, as God and only God. We're living in a day and time where people are beginning to question who Jesus really is. Who, 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 who is God? Who, who, is, who is this God? And, and God can be many things to many people. It can, be a, it can be a gray matter, whoever Jesus is. We don't really know who, Jesus, who is Jesus. Well, he was just one of the great prophets, and he, he's just one of the great prophets we see in Scripture. And there's this gray place where, where people really don't know if the Messiah has really come. Listen, I've talked to people who don't know. They, they say, we're still looking for the Messiah. They're still looking for the Messiah. They're still looking for the promise. And we see in Scripture right here that Jesus is proclaiming that he is that promise. Aren't you thankful that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is the promised Messiah. He is the mighty God, the prophet Isaiah says. Hallelujah. This term often used as God and only God. And here Isaiah is proclaiming, he's, he's predicting, if you will, one who will be far more than a man. <laughs> he is the one whom John wrote about in John 1, chapter 1, through, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You guys remember that one? He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. This word El, Elohim, God, and then all of a sudden, also he, this Hebrew word of Gabor. The root word is, is Gerber and usually translated mighty God, but more exactly, I love this terminology that Isaiah is using, this, this mighty God. He's saying that, that Jesus, this coming Messiah, will be our mighty champion. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I don't think you heard that. He will be our mighty champion, our victor. The one who pays the price for us, the one who crosses the finish line for you and me, he will be that mighty champion, our godly hero, because of, because of his grace is sufficient for us. The word Gabor means strong and mighty. It refers to someone who was bold and audacious and strong and valiant, strength and power. He, he's our hero. Is Jesus Christ your hero this morning? Is he your savior this morning? Strength and power, praise and thanksgiving for his mighty works. 
You see, in the Roman culture, when Jesus was born, there was, there was also this higher social class, if you will, of nobility who had the privilege to fight on behalf of their kingdom. And I love this terminology because Jesus, being the coming king, everybody say coming king. I'm going to keep you with me. In his text here, would be considered worthy to be mighty God since he came to do mighty works and he deserves our praise and our trust. Hallelujah. The focus of Isaiah's prophecy, El Gabor, the mighty God who is our true hero. If, you're, if you don't get anything out of this, this uh, was right here, I want you to get this term, mighty God, and why it's so important for us this morning. He is wonderful counselor. Aren't you thankful that he's our wonderful, the wonder of God, he's our counselor? but he is also mighty God. He's mighty. He's mighty to save. He's mighty to heal. And the focus here of Isaiah's prophecy is that he is a mighty God who is our true hero. And what this prophet in the 7th century B.C. anticipated, the New Testament confirms because the Messiah would be God. He would have God's power, but to Isaiah, the amazing thing is that the Messiah would not only have the power, he would not only have the power of God, but watch this, he would be the power of God. Hallelujah. Not only would he have the power of God, but he is the power of God. He would be the power of God. And my friend, you who know Jesus, this is, this is, what, will, this is what will get you this morning. You get this right here and you, and you know her. If you know Jesus then you not only know the power of God, but you have the power of God living in you. <laughs> oh, that was a good place to shout right there. That was a good place to give God thanks. <clears throat> in the middle of very difficult situations, I've been in, in, in many hospital rooms, and I've been in many ICU units, and I've been in many places where it's just really hard really hard to know what words to say, and sometimes the best thing is not to say anything at all, but just to be there and listen and pray and encourage and hug. But I, we were, um, I was spending some time with Terry last night in, in ICU, and I just, I, I said, there's such a presence of God in this place. It's in the middle of very difficult situations. Many of you know what I'm talking about this morning. It's in those places where I sense such a mighty God that words can't express. There's a peace of God. There's a presence of God in the middle. And, and I think of Psalm 46 where he says that he is a very present help in time of trouble. And in verse 10 of 46, it says, be still and know that I am God. There's times when we don't understand what is going on around us It's beyond our control. We can't control what's going on. We wish we could change it, but we can't. It's beyond our, and, and is that place where we say, Lord, I don't know why, I don't know what, but this hurts so bad, but I trust you, Lord Jesus. I trust you. I trust in the mighty God that you say, who you say you are. Small, but mighty. And I, I, I love that, um, you know, the Christmas season, we have these manger scenes, and I, and I love uh, this scene that we have here. And I think of this precious child, this baby Jesus in a manger, small but mighty. Uh, I can't even hard put words on that because you can, he's small but mighty. Mighty. Think about that. They were looking for a, a, a Messiah that would come riding a white stallion and leading an army and, and taking a revolt over the, over the Roman culture and, and leading the way for a new government and, and establishing a new throne and a new kingdom. But that's not God's, that wasn't God's plan. And we see that, that God didn't send his son into the world riding a white stallion and leading a charge, but he sent his son into the world as a baby in a manger. Small, but mighty. Luke chapter 2, part of our Christmas story and I'll begin with reading with verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. And he is, everybody say it with me, Messiah, the Lord. Verse 21, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, his name was Jesus. And I want you guys to say this name out loud with me, if you will. Say it with me, Jesus. Say it one more time, Jesus. Because watch here, when you say that name, you may not realize this, but when you say that name uh, on the eighth day, he said, he said, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise a child, his name was, G he named him Jesus and the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Jesus in the Greek from Joshua 
And this word means the Lord saves. So when you declare, when you say Jesus, you are saying Savior. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Savior. I I serve you, Jesus. I serve you, Savior. You're declaring that His mighty acts of salvation in your life. Every time you say the name Jesus, say it one more time if you will. Jesus, Luke 9, in verse 18, Peter is declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. I want you to get this in your heart today. This is the scripture in verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private, his disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowd say I am? And they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others that the one of the prophets long ago has come back to life. What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And I love how Peter answered this. And we all see this a few times in Scripture, but he says, you are God's Messiah. You are God's Messiah. You are are God's Messiah. You are God's Savior. And we need a Savior. Hallelujah. We need a Savior. And people are in need of Messiah. They're in need of a Savior. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. To bring people to an understanding of who this mighty God is, we, we have to get people to desire to know this mighty God. Everybody say mighty God. He is a mighty God. And if you have somebody that you're praying for that will come to know Jesus, you're you're praying for a family or for a loved one that's that's far from Christ, help them to see who this mighty God is. Help them to see mighty God in your life. Help them to experience and and see as a witness that, that the God you serve is a mighty God. Hallelujah. He's not a wimpy God. He's not a God that, that you feel defeated all day long. He's not a God that where you, you, you're, you're, you're looking for, 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 for other answer. You're in this place of, of questioning all the time. Don't show them a wimpy God or a God that's, that's fragile or a God that can't do what he says he will do. Show them a mighty God. Hallelujah. Show them a God that, that saves you, that set you free, that puts your place, you put your feet on a rock to stay, that you are stable in God. You're wholesome in God. You're complete in God. Show them that kind of God. Show them the faith that you have in a God who, 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 is, who he says he would be in, in your life. Let them know the stories and how God has changed you. That's what's going to compel people to know Christ. Not a wimpy God. Not a wimpy church. Not a place where we're questioning where God is or we doubt who God is. Not that, but a mighty God that we have, we serve. When people think of Rock Hill first and they think about this community of faith, I want them to see that we, that we believe in a mighty God who's able to save, who's able to heal, who's able to restore. That's the kind of God we serve. A mighty God. A powerful champion. We need a Savior. And to bring people back to the understanding, we have to show them this, this, this mighty God. We've got to show them in this, this place of grace. And aren't you thankful you're under grace today in Jesus Christ? That's a, mod, that's a mighty thing to think about, the grace of God. Because Romans 3.23 will tell us that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then it tells us also uh, that, that, the, that this, the wages of sin, in 6.23 it says the wages of sin but the, is, is death. But the gift of God, this grace that he gives, is eternal life. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. And the greatest gift you can receive this Christmas is to receive Jesus Christ to be your Savior to be your mighty God. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. This gift. And Paul is writing to a young Timothy. And I love what, what Paul is saying here. This gift of grace that we receive. 2 Timothy 1, 10 through 12. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, to light through the gospel. And, and of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because, and I love this, and you guys can declare it with me, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. What he is saying is this place of grace, this place of salvation, this place of of right standing in God, he is able to keep that until that day that return, that place where we're going to spend eternity in heaven. Aren't you thankful that this life is not what it's all about? We have a life after this life, and it's eternity with our mighty God, the the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Wonderful Counselor will be in His presence. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father, that you are a mighty God. Philippians 1.6 
being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, this work of salvation, this place of knowing who God is and walking with him, he who began a good work in you will be faithful, everybody say faithful, to complete it. We need his faithfulness in our lives. We can't complete it on our own. We have to have a mighty God working in our lives. Hallelujah. Is anybody in the room perfect? I don't, I don't think any of us are perfect. We're all in process. We're all in, in a place of, of being renewed day by day, and we need a mighty Savior, a mighty God, a mighty God of grace that can work that in our hearts. This phrase, in Christ, I want you to get this in your heart today. This phrase, in Christ, Christ is the, is the Greek for Messiah, this, this Jesus being that Savior, if you will. Matthew 121, anytime we say Jesus, I want you to get this, it's a synonym for Savior. When you say Jesus, you're saying Savior, you're declaring it. There are many religions in the world, now watch this, but only one Savior. Only one person ever claimed to be Savior, and his name is Jesus. Exalt Jesus above all else. 172 times used to describe a close personal relationship, intimate relationship with God in Christ. This, this Jesus, this, this thought of him being our Savior. We are in Christ Jesus. We are in, say that with me. I am in Christ Jesus. Say it with me. I am in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ, the Savior. I am in Christ Jesus. And Paul reminds us, he reminds the believers in Rome, and I want you to see this. Go with me, if you will, in Romans. And we're going to walk through this just for a moment. In Romans chapter 8. If you're, if you're with me, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Stay with me here, because this is, I want, this is going to be an exciting uh, word for your heart this morning. It's in Romans chapter 8. And this is where I want you to get in your heart today, that, that, that this Christmas season, the spirit of Christmas, I want you to get the spirit of Christmas in your heart and in your life. The spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit of God living in you. First of all, Paul is reminding us in Romans 8, 1 through 4, that because you are in Christ, my sins are forgiven. Oh, hallelujah. Because I am in Christ, my Savior, because I am in Savior, that my sins are forgiven. My, my, my sins have been washed away. God doesn't see my sin or my stain. Rather, he sees only the blood of his son that covers me, the blood sacrifice of the spotless lamb. Aren't you thankful for that this morning, that your sins are forgiven? Now watch this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through, Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness, the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who did not live according to the flesh, but according to what? The spirit. Live according to the spirit. So this baby in a manger, small but mighty, mighty to save. Mighty to forgive sin. Listen, your debt has been paid in full. He is a mighty Savior. He's not a Savior that comes up short, that can't do the job, that can't meet you where you are. Matter of fact, the Word says there are no heights, nor depths, nor distance where God loves can, love cannot penetrate and reach you. Hallelujah. Sir, man, there's nothing that you've done in your life that can keep God's love from penetrating into your heart. There's no limit. There's no place where you can separate yourself from God so much that where God can't reach down and save you and bring you back to restoration to himself. It's impossible. The only thing that can separate that is your own decision to not want God. Your only heart that's become callous that you have no, no, no desire to know who God is. But thanks be to God, even in that, the Holy Spirit can penetrate and oil it and get it and break it off and, bring, bring, and take off the shackles. Amen. He can take off the, 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 the blinders. He can take off the, uh, the, the, the things that cover your ears and your eyes, and you can see God for who he is. I've seen it happen before in people's lives. Oh, hallelujah, Sharon. He can do it because he is, you guys help me. Who is he? He is a mighty God. One more time, that's your chance to say it. He is a mighty God. He can do it. He can save us. He can save us. 
I love what David said. He cried out in Psalm 51 after he had committed this place of disobedience and this place of separation from God. He comes before the Lord in Psalm 51. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your great and unfailing love. And he's crying out before God. He says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And I love what he says in verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, he says. He's saying, I believe that you are mighty God and I believe that you can do this. And he says, Lord, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. And he says this, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. A willing spirit, Lord, to sustain me because you are a mighty God and you can do this. You can bring me to a place of knowing you. You can forgive me of my sins and you can create in me a pure heart, O oh God. And you, you can renew a steadfast spirit within me. I mean, this morning would say, that's me this morning, and I just want to give the Lord thanks right now because of, he has forgiven me of my sins. He's, he's my Lord. He's forgiven me of my sins. <laughs> Paul, the Apostle Paul in Romans, he also reminds us that because we are in Christ, not only are my sins have been forgiven, but his spirit lives in me. Watch this in, in, in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the fle what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God, but it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now watch this in verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. This is where the Spirit lives in you, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... They do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit that lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if to the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, you put the, to de the death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. <laughs> and in Romans 5.20, he talks about the, the grace that is greater than my sin. He says, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Hallelujah. His grace is sufficient. And his spirit lives in me. You see, this baby in a manger might be small, but this baby in a manger is a mighty God. <laughs> and when you see that baby in a manger in those nativity scenes, I want you to be reminded that even though that's a baby in a manger, he is a mighty God. Everybody say it with me. He's a mighty God. Because I'm in Christ, I'm forgiven. Because I'm in Christ, his spirit lives in me. And I love this. Paul reminds us this third place here. He says, because you are in Christ... You have a relationship with the mighty God. <laughs> and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. You guys help me? And the love we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Some of you don't know that one, some of you do. And he walks with me. And he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the love we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. It's a relationship with God, and you walk daily with him, and you, and you experience this place in God where there's this, there's this love, this intimacy with God, this, the mighty God. He is mighty. He is sovereign, he is just, and he does rule. But at the same time, he, he is my wonderful counselor. He is my mighty God. He is my everlasting father. And he is my prince of peace, and he walks with me. And he loves me. And some people think God's got so much going on that he can't do anything for them because he's got other stuff he's taking care of. But I want you to know that his eye is on you. 
The Bible says his eyes on the sparrow. <laughs> I love birds. You come in my office, you'll see that. I got bird birds all over the office. And because it reminds me that God cares about those little birds. He cares much more about me, Ms. Pat. If his eyes on that bird, his eye sees you. Matter of fact, the Bible says you're the apple of his eye. God's jealous for you, the Bible says. These are descriptive words that, that we see in the scripture where he's jealous. You're the apple of his eye. And I love this, that our relationship with God, and Paul reminds us in 8, verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a child of God if you know Jesus. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So now we who are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. I want you to understand this morning that you have a relationship. If you are in Jesus and he is in you, then he walks with you. He talks with you. He is with you. He said, I'm with you always. I will never sleep nor slumber. Matter of fact, he's praying for you. He's right with you. He's beside you. He's behind you. He's in front of you in Christ. This personal, intimate relationship. I am in Christ. I, that is, I am in a cl the closest relationship I can possibly be. My relationship is in, in Christ. It's closer than any relationship in my life. Think about it for a moment. We are either in Christ or we're not. You can't have one foot in Christ and one foot in your own life and in the world. You can't live straddling the fence, say, I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to live this way, and I'm going to just have one foot in church and one foot in the world, and I'm just going to do it. You're going to be miserable if you do that. You're either in Christ or you're not. And if you're in Christ, then he promises, he makes a covenant with you, a covenant that comes from him. All you have to do is agree to it and say, Lord, I want it. You can't change the terms of a covenant. You can change the terms of a contract. But God doesn't come to us with a contract. He comes with us with a covenant. He said, I'm going to love you unconditionally forever, and you can't do anything about it. I'm in relationship. I'm forgiven. <laughs> and I'm filled with the Spirit. And I'm in relationship with the mighty God. To be in Christ is greater than being near him. To be in Christ is, is greater than knowing about him. To be in Christ is better than being close or being around. Being in Christ means that you are with him. You're in him. It's the deepest place of relationship possible. And when you see a baby in a manger, I want you to know that he is a mighty God. And that baby in the manger changes everything about you. It can change everything about your life. My sins are forgiven. My sins are forgotten. My, his spirit lives in me. And I am in relationship with him because of that baby in a manger. That mighty God that Isaiah says. Oh, hallelujah. That mighty, mighty God. That mighty Savior, that mighty healer, that mighty God, he's my hero. <laughs> he's my sustainer. He's my everything. Now watch this. I'm going to wrap it up with this thought this morning. And those watching online, thank you so much for being with us today. But I believe this word is for somebody in particular here today, and I want you to get this in your heart. Because you may feel insignificant. You may feel that God is a thousand miles away. But I want you to see this this morning. Remember in scripture, a little boy's lunch fed over 15,000 people. A boy's slingshot in a, sm a small smooth stone slayed a giant. David's 300 mighty men defeated an army of, a th of thousands. A widow's might she gave out of her poverty, and Jesus said it was the greatest gift, the greater gift. A centurion's trust in Jesus, who said to be the greatest, was his, his faith was said to be the greatest in all of Israel by Jesus. Jesus' faith as a grain of mustard seed can move a mountain. <laughs> Jesus and his 12 traveling disciples, common men, changed their world. A baby in a manger changes everything. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And Jesus still changes the heart of those who trust in him. Do you hear me? Because he's a mighty God. He still changes the heart of those who trust in him.
Oh, yeah. My God is able. The baby, small but mighty, can change everything. I wonder where you're at this morning with that. I wonder what the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about this morning. Is he mighty God to you? Is he mighty God? Is he Jesus Savior? Is he your mighty God? Small but mighty. Don't you love that? It started out small, but it's a mighty place in God's plan. I've asked our prayer team. Matter of fact, why don't we just all stand to our feet for a moment? I would ask our prayer team if they would come and prepare and send across the front here and face the congregation. In my prayer time and my putting together this message and thinking through what the Lord would have for us this morning, I realized that there are um, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that we've learned in our congregation, our family, who have been sick in their body. Um, and I'm just, I'm just weary of that. Can I just be honest with you? I'm weary of all the, the cold, the flu, and just people just, we're sick, we're, you know, whatever, wherever's going on. And I just, I, I want you to know that, that he is a mighty God. There's people who have, there's situations just physically that you don't know what's going on in your body, and you're, you're you maybe, well, maybe you're anxious about that, and you're, and you're asking questions, you're seeking help, whatever you're doing, but I want you to trust in a mighty God this morning. James chapter 5, he talks about this place of faith. He says, he says if you have a, a need, any, anyone sick among you, he says, come before the elders of the church, let them anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. And it says, a prayer of righteous is powerful and what? Effective. If we pray that prayer in the name of Jesus, the Savior, the mighty God, <laughs> and have faith in a mighty God. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online and you say, Pastor Steve, I'm, I'm without Jesus and I need to know this mighty God you're talking about. He's mighty to save. Anyone in this room at the balcony and in, in the main floor, he's mighty to save and there's, nothing, there's no sin that can separate you from his grace. 